Not too long ago, I read a story that was pretty sad. It was about a three-year-old girl who was in the hospital recovering from severe burns she had received from her mother's live-in boyfriend. Good to know that that perpetrator is now in jail, and we hope and pray that the little girl will recover from these serious wounds. Unfortunately, we hear these kind of stories all the time. Why is this one any different? What's different is that the mother and the boyfriend are both counselors. They met at a behavioral health facility for children and their family. Now, while we grieve for the little girl, we are totally mystified how it can be that two counselors' behavior can be as such. It's not only puzzling why someone could abuse a child that how could a mother allow a person to move in with her and watch four children while she was at work, especially when she knew that the other counselor had been fired as a counselor? But yet these two people are counselors. How can they be family counselors when their wife is so messed up in the first place? You know, let's face it, we all need counselors in our life. We all need to have some counsel to navigate this life that we live and all the problems and questions that arise. But when I read this story, it makes me wonder, when we need a counselor, where can we turn? Where can we find a counselor who won't lead us astray? Where can we find a counselor who will really help us? Well, I could say that my associate pastor, Nick Orange, could, uh, could be that, but uh, and he probably can. But what we really want to say here at Advent is the counselor we need is this Christ child that we celebrate at Christmas. The prophet Isaiah describes this wonderful child to be born as a divine person. People in every era expect their ruler to be powerful and to <coughs> use their power to benefit the people that rule. However, the reality is that ordinary rulers, despite all of the hopes of the people, seldom fulfill their promises and live up to the bill that has been put there. Kings and pre presidents are promises are notorious for delivering little, but not the wonderful child, not the wonderful counselor, because expressively in the book of Isaiah, it says he is the mighty Fully human, fully divine, the God of human redemption. Wonderful, that word is a Hebrew word, Pele, referring to one who works wonders. That is, who works miracles. The angel of the Lord, who Orthodox Christians believe to be the pre incarnate Christ, identified this child as wonderful. Now perhaps some of you remember the Old Testament story of Samson. Anybody remember Samson? In the story of Samson, if you read the entire thing, I mean, what we mostly think about is Samson's long hair and his strength, but there's more of a story there. And actually, there's an angel of the Lord who appears to Samson's barren mother and announces a birth of this key person in the story of redemption. In fact, often in the Bible we have these same types of stories where an angel of the Lord announces the birth of someone who's really important in the story of redemption from God. For instance, he announces the birth of Isaac to Abraham and Sarah. He announces the birth of Samson to his mother. And the angel Gabriel announced the birth of Jesus to Joseph and Mary. Now in the case of Isaac and Samson's birth, it's not an ordinary angel, if there's such a thing as an ordinary angel. It's the angel of the Lord, it says very specifically. It is God himself made visible. Now, Monan, who is Samson's father, hears the angel's announcement of Samson's birth and asks, him, what is his name? And he says, why do you ask me what my name is? For it is wonderful. Wonderful. The name of God of wonders. And Monon understands that 
when he enters this angel that it is God himself because he goes on to say, Wife, we will surely die, for we have seen God. The God of wonders. That's who this wonderful child we celebrated Advent in. That's what is made clear in the New Testament, even for those who don't believe to be him to be the divine king promised by the prophet Isaiah. If you remember on Palm Sunday, Jesus enters Jerusalem and is greeted with shouts of Hosanna to the Son of David. Or more literally translated in English, save us, Lord of David. Jesus goes to the temple, he drives out the money changers, restores the house to its original state and place for God. And he says, my house should be called a house of prayer. The temple is not the merchant's house, nor is it the priest's house. It is my house, says Jesus. It's the house of God. The blind and lame come to Jesus in the temple and we're told he heals them. And the unbelieving priests and scribes convict themselves by what they say. Because the Bible tells us they saw all these wonderful things and they still didn't believe. Those miracles are ones the priest and the scribe saw identified Jesus as the wonderful counselor, that miracle worker, the God of wonders. Secondly, Jesus is the wonderful counselor because of what he does, the all powerful Son of God. Note that wonderful is the second part of that title. No? It's, part, or, I'm sorry, it's half of the title. He's also known as a counselor which comes from the Hebrew word yes, which means <coughs> Jesus is wise in wisdom and shares with humanity the truth, which is something really important for us that Tim was sharing in the children's sermon this morning. Isaiah says, The Lord of hosts, wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. You know, sometimes we think in the Old Testament, as we read through it, that God is pretty vindictive and pretty judgmental and the way he deals with his people, the way he deals with other people. But God has a wise plan when he's dealing with his stubborn and sinful people, Israel. And he has a plan for those who are surrounding worshiping pagans as well. Israel and Jerusalem both go through exile, as I expressed last week, in the hands of their neighbors for punishment for their sins. But soon after... Those neighbors, too, are destroyed for their sins, their unbelief, and their arrogance. No doubt, God is mighty and great in wisdom to fulfill God's plan. But God is not just a God of judgment and wrath. We know because we are New Testament people. God's wise plan, as Isaiah promises, also has a gracious provision for a Savior, a wonderful counselor. Ordinary counselors typically give advice and direction. Maybe to help a client try to figure out how to have a healthy and safe lifestyle, live happier. But the special, unique wisdom of a wonderful counselor is not found in giving advice or rules. We already have plenty of rules, right? The special, unique of the wonderful counselor is the cross. The message of the cross is that the wonderful counselor died to free us from sin and guilt and bring us back to God. The message of the cross is foolishness for those who are unrepentant to say the least. St. Paul says in one of his writings, it's folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are saved, it's the power of God. And then Paul goes on to say, Jesus Christ is the source of your life and that He is our wisdom and our righteousness and our sanctification and our redemption. How is it that we get this counsel from Jesus who lived 2,000 years ago and no longer is with us? We find this counsel through many ways, but some of those are through the ordinances of the church. Things that soon my brother in the faith, Nick, will be charged to, to handle for congregations and for individuals. That is, when we celebrate the Last Supper. Jesus' disciples were saddened to learn that he would die and 
that he would be gone from them. But Jesus reassured them by saying, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, or a counselor, to be with you forever. And then later in that discourse, Jesus says, the counselor will teach you all things, and to you bring remembrance of all the things that I have said. And so it's through things like baptism and communion and the Word that the Spirit of Jesus comes to us and promises us that He will remain with us and give us counsel. For instance, the Great Commission, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teach them all I have commanded you, and lo, I will be with you until the end of the age. And so through our baptisms, through Holy Communion, through the Word, that Spirit of Jesus that lives on brings us counsel on how it is we should live. Now as I reflect upon the idea of the wonderful counselor, it seems to me there are two kinds of counselors. There's the wonderful counselor who comes to us through sacrament and through the Word, and there is the kind of counsel who gives us good advice, more or less. We certainly know that the world wants to be our counselor. I don't think anyone can doubt that. This dark and fallen and lost world that we live in is always trying to give us advice. Tell us what we should do, what we shouldn't do, and how we should do it. But God and His Word wants us to be given the wonderful advice. The wonderful direction. It doesn't really take much of a genius to see the further away that one gets from the counsel of Jesus, how it is Jesus asked us to live and shared with us how to live, that we become more confused and more troubled. I mean, I think that's why it is that for people like me and Nick, that oftentimes, quite frankly, we're overlooked. Nobody pays much attention to us. Nobody really cares very much about us. And oftentimes, in the culture we live in today, we give us very little respect. But I guarantee you, when things get bad, when someone's really ill, when someone's really in trouble, when there's a death, they're not calling the Ghostbusters. They're calling folks like us. And they're doing that not because that me and Nick or people like us are really special. It's just that we have been given that gift to share the counsel of the wonderful counsel. That we have been trained, we have spent a lifetime studying and preparing ourselves to give the counsel that Jesus has already given to the world, that for some reason people are unable to hear. And so the further we step away, the more darkness and confused we become. But if we listen to that counsel of the wonderful counsel, that we meet at the cross, that is forgiveness for sins for all of us, that if we repent and receive the faith that Isaiah spoke about from the wonderful child who was promised to us. And in fact, it is sinners like me and you that God sent Jesus to us in the first place to be here with us. That's probably the most beloved verse in the Bible that tells us that, doesn't it? For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. Exactly. We have a lot of decisions that we have to make in our life. Some of them are really easy. You know, yesterday after the Butler ball game, me and the boys were deciding where to eat. And since Bob is, one of his jobs right now is working at Urban Greens, it was pretty easy. We'll go to Urban Greens so we can see Bob and eat there. Pretty easy decision. Other decisions in life are really difficult. When do I decide that my loved one no longer can live peacefully and we disconnect life support? Not an easy decision. I've been with families when they went through that. It's not an easy decision to make. How should I raise my children? It's not an easy decision to make. That list goes on and on. The wonderful counselor really has given us advice on how to make those decisions. And a place into the heart's empowerment for people to help you make those tough decisions in life through the decisions and the lifestyle that Jesus has made. 
As we maneuver our way through life, it's difficult. There's no doubt about it. And questions will arise that will be found to fiddle us and, and make us wonder what in the world should we do. Always lean upon Jesus. You know, sometimes I wish that I actually had a Bible that had nothing in it except the stories of Jesus, period. What Jesus said, those red letter words that some Bibles have, and those short snippets of stories. I don't think it would be a very long book, but I think it would be a really good book. Because again, guys, sometimes when we start reading the whole story, we get convoluted with too many things. I, I'm not an Old Testament theologian, but as you read the Old Testament, sometimes you're thinking, again, as I said, boy, God sounds pretty vengeful. But the stories of Jesus aren't like that at all. And that is who I put my life and my state on, is Jesus. So listen, during this Advent season, as we prepare for the birth of God being with us, listen to the counsel of the one who is. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise, Praise God. God. I would invite you now.